and happy Halloween. Halloween is one of the best times of the year, but for lots of people this year, it's a little bit different. In this little bonus episode, you'll hear some familiar voices and some that might be new to you tell their favourite spooky tale. Joe and Faye from the Ghost Trails series on YouTube tell two real-life ghost stories. Dave Keane from 50p Movie Club tells the story of the Grey Man. And Sinead from the Poisoner's Cabinet tells the story of the lottery. And I tell the story of the Red Room. We hope you enjoy and happy Halloween. Hello to everyone out there in the Real Life Ghost Stories family. I'm Faye, one half of the YouTube series The Ghost Trail. So first up, a massive thank you to Emma, Dan and Tiny Bims for having us in your Halloween special. I'm going to be bringing you a real life tale from a friend of a friend, who I can assure you, as I've met them, is not prone to flights of fancy and was, until this experience, a self-proclaimed sceptic. So the person in question works in a pub in Ireland. Now the pub has been trading in its current incarnation for 23 years, and prior to that there's been a pub on the site since all the way back to 1825. So, getting back to the story. One night when he was working there was a power cut, and he had to usher all the customers outside for health and safety reasons, while he sorted the situation out. So he cleared the bar, closed the doors, was absolutely sure there was no one else still remaining, and was moving around by the light of the candles placed around the bar, when they also blew out one by one, leaving him in the dark. He pulled his lighter from his pocket and held it up, a light when a man suddenly appeared at his shoulder. As he stood frozen in shock, the man leant forward and blew on the lighter, extinguishing the flame and leaving him in almost complete darkness. A couple of seconds later, he saw a figure running the length of the pub in the shadows behind the bar before disappearing. He was completely certain that he was the only living person in the establishment and stayed frozen in shock for a few more moments, the hair rising on the back of his neck and his heart thundering. Now, the following day, he discussed the incident with another member of staff and they pointed at some photographs framed behind the bar. And upon looking at them, he recognized the man he'd seen the night before standing next to him. And it turns out that this man used to own the pub but had passed on a few years previously. Now, this incident took place last year, and I don't know if anything has happened since then, but you can be sure I will ask every time I see this person from now on. The Lottery by Shirley Jackson The morning of June 27th was clear and sunny, with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers were blossoming profusely, and the grass was richly green. The people of the village began to gather in the square, between the post office and the bank, at around 10 o'clock. In some towns, there were so many people that the lottery took two days and had to be started on June 26th. But in this village, there were only about 300 people, and the whole lottery took less than two hours. So it could begin at 10 o'clock in the morning and still be through in time to allow the villagers to get home for noon dinner. The children assembled first, of course. School was recently over for the summer, and the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. They tended to gather together quietly for a while before they broke into boisterous play, and their talk was still of the classroom and the teacher, of books and reprimands. Bobby Martin had already stuffed his pockets with stones, and the other boys soon followed his example, selecting the smoothest and roundest stones. Bobby and Harry Jones and Dickie Delacroix, the villagers pronounced his name Delacroix, eventually made a great pile of stones in one corner of the square and guarded it against the raids of other boys. The girls stood aside, talking amongst themselves, looking over their shoulders at the boys, and the very small children rolled in the dust or clung to the hands of their older brothers and sisters. Soon the men began to gather surveying their own children, speaking of planting and rain, tractors and taxes. They stood together, away from the pile of stones in the corner, and their jokes were quiet and they smiled rather than laughed. The women, wearing faded house dresses and sweaters, came shortly after their menfolk, 
They greeted one another and exchanged bits of gossip as they went to join their husbands. Soon the women, standing by their husbands, began to call their children, and the children came reluctantly, having to be called four or five times. Bobby Martin ducked behind his mother's grasping hand and ran, laughing, back to the pile of stones. His father spoke up sharply, and Bobby came quickly and took his place between his father and his oldest brother. The lottery was conducted, as were the square dances, the teen club, the Halloween programme, by Mr Summers, who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. He was a round-faced, jovial man, and he ran the coal business. People were sorry for him because he had no children, and his wife was a scold. When he arrived in the square carrying the black wooden box, there was a murmur of conversation amongst the villagers, and he waved and called, a little late today, folks. The postmaster, Mr Graves, followed him, carrying a three-legged stool, and the stool was placed at the centre of the square, and Mr Summers sat the black box down on it. The villagers kept their distance, leaving a space between them and the stool, and when Mr Summers said, some of you fellows want to give me a hand, there was a hesitation before two men, Mr Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, came forward to hold the box steady on the stool, while Mr Summers stirred up the papers inside. The original paraphernalia for the lottery had been lost long ago, and the black box now resting on the stool had been put to use even before Old Man Warner, the oldest man in town, was born. Mr Summers spoke frequently to the villagers about making a new box, but no one liked to upset even as much tradition as was represented by the black box. There was a story that the present box had been made with some pieces of the box that had preceded it, the one that had been constructed when the first people settled down to make a village here. Every year after the lottery, Mr Summers began talking about a new box, but every year the subject was allowed to fade off without anything being done. The black box grew shabbier each year. By now it was no longer completely black, but splintered badly along one side to show the original wood colour, and some places faded or stained. Mr Martin and his oldest son Baxter held the box securely on the stool until Mr Summers had stirred the papers thoroughly with his hand. Because so much of the ritual had been forgotten or discarded, Mr Summers had been successful in having slips of paper substituted for the chips of wood that had been used for generations. Chips of wood, Mr Summers had argued, had all been very well when the village was tiny, but now the population was more than 300 and likely to keep growing. It was necessary to use something that would fit more easily into the black box. The night before the lottery, Mr Summers and Mr Graves made up slips of paper and put them in the box and then it was taken to the safe of Mr. Summers Coal Company and locked up until Mr. Summers was ready to take to the square the next morning. The rest of the year the box was put away, sometimes one place, sometimes another. It had spent one year in Mr. Graves' barn and another year underfoot in the post office, and sometimes it was set on a shelf in the Martin grocery and left there. There was a great deal of fussing to be done before Mr. Summers declared the lottery open. There were the lists to make up, of heads of families, heads of households in each family, members of each household in each family. There was the proper swearing in of Mr. Summers by the postmaster as the official of the lottery. At one time, some people remembered, there had been a recital of some sort performed by the official of the lottery, a perfunctory tuneless chant that had been rattled off duly each year. Some people believed that the official of the lottery used to stand just so when he said or sang it. Others believed he was supposed to walk amongst the people, but years and years ago this part of the ritual had been allowed to lapse. There had been also a ritual salute which the official of the lottery had to use in addressing each person who came up to the draw from the box, but this had also changed with time. Mr Summers was very good at all of this, in his clean white shirt and blue jeans, with one hand resting carelessly on the black box, he seemed very popular and important as he talked interminably to Mr Graves and the Martins. Just as Mr Summers finally led off talking and turned to the assembled villagers, Mrs Hutchinson came hurriedly along the path to the square, her sweater thrown over her shoulders and slid into place in the back of the crowd. Oh, clean forgot what day it was, she said to Mr Delacroix, who stood next to her, and they both laughed softly. I thought my old man was out back stacking wood. Then I looked out the window and the kids was gone and I remembered it was the 27th and came a-running. She dried her hands on her apron and Mrs. Delacroix said, You're in time though. 
still talking away up there. Mrs. Hutchinson craned her neck to see through the crowd and found her husband and children standing near the front. She tapped Mrs. Delacroix on the arm as a farewell and began to make her way through the crowd. The people separated good-humouredly to let her through. Two or three people said in voices just loud enough to be heard across the crowd, Here comes your Mrs. Hutchinson. And, Bill, she made it after all. Mrs. Hutchinson reached her husband. And Mr. Summers, who had been waiting, said cheerfully, Thought we were going to have to get on without you, Tessie. Mrs. Hutchinson said, grinning, Wouldn't have me leave my dishes in the sink now, would you, Joe? And soft laughter ran through the crowd, and the people stirred back into position after Mrs. Hutchinson's arrival. Well now, Mr. Summers said soberly. Guess we better get started. Get this over with so as we can get back to work. Anybody ain't here? Dunbar, several people said. Mr. Summers consulted his list. Clyde Dunbar? Well, that's right, he broke his leg, hasn't he? Who's drawing for him? Me, I guess, a woman said. And Mr. Summers turned to look at her. Wife draws for her husband. Don't you have a grown boy to do it for you, Janie? Although Mr. Summers and everyone else in the village knew the answer perfectly well, it was the business of the official, of the lottery, to ask such questions formally. Mr. Summers waited, with an expression of polite interest, while Mrs. Dunby answered. Horace is not but sixteen yet, Mrs. Summers said regretfully. Guess I got a feeling for the old man this year. Right, Mr. Summers said, and he made a note on the list he was holding. Then he asked, Watson boy drawing this year? A tall boy in the crowd raised his hand. Here, he said. I'm drawing for my mother and me. He blinked his eyes nervously and ducked his head at several voices in the crowd, saying things like, Good fellow, lad. Glad to see your mother's got a man to do it. Well, Mr. Summers said, guess that's everyone. The old man wanna make it. Here, a voice said. And Mr. Summers nodded. A sudden hush fell over the crowd. There was Mr. Summers cleared his throat and looked at the list. Already, he called. Now I'll read the names, heads of family first, and the men come up and take a paper out of the box. Keep the paper folded in your hand without looking at it until everybody has had a turn. Everything clear? The people had done it so many times that they only half listened to the directions. Most of them were quiet, wetting their lips, not looking around. Then Mr. Summers raised one hand high and said, Adams. A man disengaged himself from the crowd and came forward. Hi, Steve, Mr. Summers said. Mr. Adams said, Hi, Joe. And they grinned at each other humorously and nervously. Then Mr. Adams reached into the black box and took out a folded paper. He held it firmly by one corner as he turned and went hastily back to his place in the crowd, where he stood a little apart from his family, not looking down at his hand. Alan, Mr. Summers said. Anderson. Bentham. Seems like there's no time at all between the lotteries anymore, Mrs. Delacroix said to Mrs. Graves in the back row. Seems like we got through with the last one only last week. Well, time sure goes fast, Mrs. Graves said. Clark. Delacroix. There goes my old man, Mrs. Delacroix said. She held her breath while her husband went forward. Dunbar, Mr. Summers said. And Mrs. Dunbar went steadily to the box while one of the women said, Go on, Janie! We're next, Mrs. Graves said. She watched while Mr. Graves came around from the side of the box, greeted Mr. Summers gravely, and selected a slip of paper from the box. By now, all through the crowd, there were men holding the small folded papers in their large hand, turning them over and over nervously. Mrs. Dunbar and her two sons stood together, Mrs. Dunbar holding the slip of paper. Harbert? Hutchinson? Get up there, Bill, Mrs. Hutchinson said, and the people near her laughed. Jones? The do say, Mr. Adams said to old man Warner, who stood next to him. Then over in the North Village, they're talking of giving up the lottery. Old Man Warner snorted. Pack of crazy fools, he said. Listening to the young folk, nothing's good enough for them. Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to go back living in caves. Nobody work anymore, lived that way for a while. Used to be a saying, lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. First thing you know, we'd all be eating stewed chicken weed and acorns. There's always been a lottery. He added petulantly. Bad enough you see young Joe Summers up there joking with everyone. 
Some places already quit the lotteries, Mrs. Adams said. Nothing but trouble in there, old man Warner said stoutly. Pack of young fools. Martin. And Bobby Martin watched his father go forward. Overdyke. Percy. I wish they'd hurry, Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. I wish they'd hurry. They're almost through, though, her son said. You get ready to run. Tell Dad, Mrs. Dunbar said. Mr. Summers called his own name, then stepped forward precisely and selected a slip from the box. Then he called. Warner. 77th year I've been in the lottery, old man Warner said as he went through the crowd. 77th time. Watson. The tall boy came awkwardly through the crowd. Someone said, Don't be nervous, Jack. And Mr. Summers said, Take your time, son. Zanini. After that, there was a long pause. A breathless pause. Until Mr. Summers, holding his slip of paper in the air, said, All right, fellows. For a minute, no one moved. Then all the slips of paper were opened. Suddenly, all the women began to speak at once, saying, Who is it? Who's got it? Is it the Dunbars? Is it the Watsons? Then the voices began to say, It's Hutchinson. It's Bill. Bill Hutchinson's got it. Go tell your father, Mrs. Dunbar said to her oldest son. People began to look around to see the Hutchinsons. Bill was standing quietly, staring down at the paper in his hand. Suddenly, Tessie Hutchinson shouted to Mr. Summers, You didn't give him time enough to take any paper he wanted. I, I saw you. It, it wasn't fair. Be a good sport, Tessie, Mrs. Delacroix called, and Mrs. Graves said, All of us took the same chance. Shut up, Tessie, Bill Hutchinson said. Well, everyone, Mr. Summers said, That was done pretty fast. We've got to be hurrying a little more to get it done in time. He consulted his next list. Bill, he said, you draw for the Hutchinson family. You got any other households in the Hutchinsons? As Don and Eva, Mrs. Hutchinson yelled, Make them take their chance! Daughters draw with their husband's family, Tessie, Mr. Summers said gently. You know that as well as anyone else. It wasn't fair, Tessie said. I guess not, Joe, Bill Hutchinson said regretfully. My daughter draws with her husband's family. That's only fair. And I've got no other family except the kids. Then as far as drawing for families is concerned, it's you, Mr. Summers said in explanation. And as far as drawing for households is concerned, that's you too, right? Right, Bill Hutchinson said. How many kids, Bill? Mr. Summers asked formally. Three. There's Bill, Junior, and Nancy, and little Dave, and, and Tessie, and me. All right, then, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you got the tickets back? Mr. Graves nodded and held up the slips of paper. Put them in the box, then, Mr. Summers directed. Take bills and put it in. I think we ought to start over, Mrs. Hutchinson said as quietly as she could. I tell you it wasn't fair. You, you didn't give him enough time to choose. Everybody saw that. Mr. Graves had selected the five slips and put them in the box, and he dropped all the papers but those onto the ground, where the breeze caught them and lifted them off. Listen, everybody, Mrs. Hutchinson was saying to the people around her. Ready, Bill? Mr. Summers asked, and Bill Hutchinson, with one quick glance around at his wife and children, nodded. Remember, Mr. Summers said, take the slips and keep them folded until each person has taken one. Harry, you help little Dave. Mr. Graves took the hand of the little boy who came willingly with him up to the box. Take a paper out of the box, Davy, Mr. Summers said. Davy put his hand into the box and laughed. Take just one paper, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you hold it for him. Mr. Graves took the child's hand and removed the folded paper from the tight fist and held it where little Dave stood next to him and looked up at him wonderingly. Nancy next, Mr. Summers said. Nancy was twelve, and her school friends breathed heavily as she went forward, switching her skirt, and took a slip daintily from the box. Bill Jr., Mr. Summers said, 
and Billy, his face red and his feet over large, nearly knocked the box over as he got the paper out. Tessie, Mr. Summers said. She hesitated for a moment, looking around defiantly, and then set her lips and went up to the box, and she snatched the paper out and held it behind her. Bill. And Bill Hutchinson reached into the box and felt around, bringing his hand out at last with the slip of paper on it. The crowd was quiet. A girl whispered, I hope it's not Nancy. And the sound of the whisper reached the edges of the crowd. It's not the way it used to be, Old Man Warner said clearly. People ain't the way they used to be. All right, Mr. Summers said. Open the papers. Harry, you open little Dave's. Mr. Graves opened the slip of paper, and there was a general sigh through the crowd as he held it up and everyone could see it was blank. Nancy and Bill Jr. opened theirs at the same time and both beamed and laughed, turning around to the crowd and holding up the slips of paper above their heads. Tessie, Mr. Summers said. There was a pause, and then Mr. Summers looked at Bill Hutchinson, and Bill unfolded his paper and showed it. It was blank. It's Tessie, Mr. Summers said, and his voice was hushed. Show us her paper, Bill. Bill Hutchinson went over to his wife and forced the slip of paper out of her hand. It had a black spot on it, the black spot Mr. Summers had made the night before with heavy pencil in the coal company office. Bill Hutchinson held it up and there was a stir in the crowd. All right, folks, Mr. Summers said. Let's finish quickly. Although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost the original black box, they still remembered to use stones. The pile of stones the boys had made earlier was ready. There were stones on the ground with the blowing scraps of paper that had come out of the box. Delacroix selected a stone so large she had to pick it up with both hands and turned to Mrs. Dunbar. Come on, she said, hurry up. Mr. Dunbar had large stones in both hands and she said, gasping for breath, I can't run at all. You'll have to go ahead. I'll catch up with you. The children had stones already and someone gave little Davy Hutchinson a few pebbles. Tessie Hutchinson was in the centre of a cleared space by now. She held her hands out desperately as the villagers moved in on her. It isn't fair, she said. A stone hit her on the side of the head. Old man Warner was saying, Come on, come on, everyone. Steve Adams was at the front of the crowd of villagers, with Mrs. Graves beside him. It isn't fair! It isn't fair! It isn't right! Mrs. Hutchinson screamed, and then they were upon her. Hi, I'm Jo from the YouTube series The Ghost Trail, and I'd like to share a personal story of something unexplained I experienced about 15 years ago. I was touring Scotland with a play, it was a three-hander, me, another girl called Gemma, and a guy. For two weeks we were put up in the outskirts of Edinburgh, in a house that honestly looked as though it was taken straight out of a horror movie. I remember driving down heaps of country lanes, getting lost, and eventually arriving at the gate to the property. It had one of those old-fashioned iron gates at the entrance, rusty and ancient looking. We opened them, then drove up a long, windy driveway to find a massive, gothic-looking mansion at the top. The house was very isolated and unlike anywhere I'd ever really stayed before. I instantly felt uneasy, but we were greeted by a very friendly lady who told us that the house had belonged to her mother. When the mother passed away, this lady had converted it into apartments, which she rented out. Gemma, the other girl on my tour, and I were to share one apartment, and the guy, whose name I forget, had an apartment to himself. Now, there have only ever been a couple of occasions where I've been so overcome by fear I found it hard to function normally, but as soon as I stepped into our apartment I was consumed with an overwhelming sense of apprehension and dread. The apartment was a strange layout, very long, narrow and unhomely. As soon as you walked through the front door you could see a bedroom directly opposite. 
This was the room I took. The hallway from the front door went to the left and then led onto a longer hallway to the right. All the other rooms were off this longer hallway, the other bedroom where Gemma stayed being right at the end of it and the furthest room away from mine. I asked Gemma if she felt the place had an unsettling vibe, but she said she felt okay, so I didn't press the matter. The first night there was the worst. After hours of trying to fall asleep and not succeeding, I suddenly felt as though someone was looking at me. You know how sometimes you can just sense it when someone is staring at you? I opened my eyes to see an old lady standing at the foot of my bed and staring right at me. Now, I know many people will say that this was sleep paralysis, and I have often wondered if it was myself, but I was 100% awake. After what felt like ages, I managed to build up the courage to move and turn on the bedside lamp, at which point she disappeared. I could still feel her staring at me though, even though I could no longer see her. I'd like to point out that this room was aesthetically quite odd. It had strange glass cabinets in it that looked as though they belonged in some kind of medical or laboratory setting. I mentioned to Gemma again that I felt uneasy, and she decorated my room with all her lovely vintage scarves she had with her, trying to brighten it up and cover the creepy cabinets. As the days passed, I felt more and more drained. I didn't sleep. I had to have the lights on at all times in the apartment, and I couldn't shower without Gemma sitting by the door and talking to me the whole time. Although I didn't see the old lady again, I knew she was there, watching, and I knew I wasn't welcome in this building. After what felt like forever, the two weeks were finally up. As we were in the van driving away, our boss called. She wanted to check how the tour was going and to see if we liked the accommodation. She took pride in putting her actors up in nice places due to some of the horrendous places she had stayed when she had toured as an actor in the past. Not wanting to be rude, I told her that the house had been lovely, to which she replied, Thank goodness! I had another group stay there last month and they hated it, said it was haunted by an old lady. So, there you go. I was not the only one to see her. I'm not sure whether it was the ghost of the lady who had lived there before her daughter made it into apartments, or maybe she had also been haunted by this ghost herself. With a property this old, it would have had many occupants over the years. I can't for the life of me remember where it was now, or what it was called. Although if I could, I definitely wouldn't go back there anyway. Am Fear the Moor is the Gaelic name of a mythical creature dwelling on the summit of Scotland's Ben Macdui mountain. It is also known as the Big Grey Man. As the second tallest mountain in Scotland and the United Kingdom, Ben Macdui is 4,295 feet at its highest elevation and is a part of the Cairngorm mountain range. Many hikers who have ventured to the summit claim to have had a terrifying encounter with the Big Grey Man. They have either seen or felt his dark presence. They often describe him as very large, sometimes about 10 feet tall when erect, Short hair covers his body, and he has very broad shoulders and long arms that gesticulate wildly. Sightings and reports of Amphir the Moor go back at least a couple of centuries, but the first credible experience took place back in 1891. Professor Norman Colley was a respected mountaineer who had a strange experience during his ascent on Ben Magdui. At a meeting of the Cairngorm Club in 1925, he would go into more detail. I was returning from a cairn on the summit in the mist when I began to think I heard something else other than my own footsteps. For every few steps I took I heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if something was walking after me but taking footsteps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened and heard it again but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on and the eerie crunch, crunch sounded behind me, I became amazed with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles, nearly down to Rothimulkis Forest. Whatever you make of it, I do not know, but there is something very queer at the top of Ben Mark Dewey, and I will not go there again by myself, I know. Collie's account was a terrifying one, but hardly unique. His revelation started a deluge of similar stories and reports from numerous other climbers, many of which went directly to Collie himself. Without a doubt, 
One of the more fantastic reports came from a man named Alexander Tunian. In 1943, Tunian claimed that while he was on Ben Dewey, he shot at and possibly wounded something in the mists. While Tunian was descending the mountain along the Coir at Chacken Path, a strange shadow-like form appeared out of nowhere and seemed to be heading straight for him. Fearing for his safety, Tunian fired a trio of shots with his revolver before fleeing in the direction of Glen Derry. Whatever the big grey man is, witnesses more often feel it or sense it than they see it. Climbers say they sense the feeling of dread and panic. That sense was sometimes accompanied by eerie footsteps or other sounds that seem to follow the climber. Most encounters tend to occur just below the skyline, close to a region known to the locals as Larig Gru Pass. Witnesses also report that the terror can become so intense and overwhelming that the urge to jump off the cliff at Lurcher's Crag is seriously considered as an option. Some people are of the opinion that this is precisely what the big grey man of Ben McDewey is attempting to accomplish. Witnesses who report an encounter with a big grey man are often reluctant to return to the scene of their encounter. Professor Colley went on record with that sentiment. Scientific researchers looking into these sightings offer something in the realm of a possible explanation as to what exactly is going on at Ben McDewey. There is a phenomenon researchers call a Brocken Spectre, Brocken Bow or Mountain Spectre. It is a trick of light that plays on the eye which makes a person believe an enormous shadow creature is facing the observer. This optical illusion results when a projection of the observer's own shadow reflects onto a misty mountainside or cloud bank opposite the sun. First identified by Johann Silberschlag in 1780 in the German Haas mountain range, it can even be seen from inside airborne aircraft. Although there is at least one scientific explanation for Amphir the Moor or the Big Grey Man on Ben McDewey Mountain, encounters are terrifying and very real to the experiencer. Is there a creature like the mythical Yeti or Bigfoot waiting for discovery high in the Scottish mountains? Scientists have classified approximately 1.7 million species of animals. They estimate that this is only about a quarter of all species on the planet. For if they are correct, there are millions more undiscovered. The existence of the Big Grey Man is not beyond the realm of possibility. I can assure you, said I, that it will take a very tangible ghost to frighten me. And I stood up before the fire, with my glass in my hand. It is your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm, and glanced at me in askings. Eight and twenty years, said I, I've lived, and never a ghost have I seen as yet. The old woman sat staring hard into the fire, her pale eyes wide open. Ay, she broke in. And eight and twenty years you have lived, and never seen the likes of this house, I reckon. There's a many things to see, when one's still but eight and twenty. She swayed her head slowly from side to side. A many things to see, and sorrow for. I half suspected the old people were trying to enhance the spiritual terrors of their house by their droning insistence. I put down my empty glass on the table and looked about the room and caught a glimpse of myself, abbreviated and broadened to an impossible sturdiness in the queer old mirror at the end of the room. Well, I said, if I see anything tonight, I shall be so much the wiser, for I come to the business with an open mind. It's your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm once more. I heard the faint sound of a stick and a shambling step on the flags in the passage outside. The door creaked on its hinges as a second old man entered, more bent, more wrinkled, more aged even than the first. He supported himself by the help of a crutch, 
His eyes were covered by a shade and his lower lip, half averted, hung pale and pink from his decaying yellow teeth. He made straight for an armchair on the opposite side of the table, sat down clumsily and began to cough. The man with the withered hand gave the newcomer a short glance of positive dislike. The old woman took no notice of his arrival, but remained with her eyes fixed steadily on the fire. I said, it's your own choosing, said the man with the withered hand when the coughing had ceased for a while. It's my own choosing, I answered. The man with the shade became aware of my presence for the first time and threw his head back for a moment and sideways to see me. I caught a momentary glimpse of his eyes, small and bright and inflamed. Then he began to cough and splutter again. Why don't you drink, said the man with the withered arm, pushing the beer towards him. The man with the shade poured out a glassful with a shaking hand that splashed half as much again on the deal table. A monstrous shadow of him crouched upon the wall and mocked his action as he poured and drank. I must confess, I had scarcely expected these grotesque custodians. There is, to my mind, something inhuman, in senility, something crouching and atavistic. The human quality seemed to drop from old people insensibly day by day. The three of them made me feel uncomfortable with their gaunt silences, their bent carriage, their evident unfriendliness to me and to one another. And that night, perhaps, I was in the mood for uncomfortable impressions. I resolved to get away from their vague foreshadowings of the evil things upstairs. If, said I, you will show me to this haunted room of yours, I will make myself comfortable there. The old man with the cough jerked his head back so suddenly that it startled me and shot another glance of his red eyes at me from out of the darkness under the shade. But no one answered me. I waited a minute, glancing from one to the other. The old woman stared like a dead body glaring into the fire with lacklustre eyes. <clears throat> if, I said a little louder, if you will show me to this haunted room of yours, I will relieve you from the task of entertaining me. There is a candle on the slab outside the door, said the man with the withered hand, looking at my feet as he addressed me. But if you go to the red room tonight... This night of all nights, said the old woman softly. You go alone. Very well, I answered shortly. And which way do I go? You go along the passage for a bit, said he, nodding his head on his shoulder at the door. Until you come to a spiral staircase. And on the second landing is a door, covered with a green baize. Go through that, and down the long corridor to the end and the red room is on your left, up the steps. Have I got that right? I said, and repeated his directions. He corrected me in one particular. And you are really going, said the man with the shade, looking at me again for the third time, with that queer, unnatural tilting of his face. This night of all nights, whispered the old woman. It is what I came for, I said and moved towards the door. As I did so, the old man with the shade rose and staggered around the table, so as to be closer to the others and to the fire. At the door, I turned and looked at them, and saw that they were all close together, dark against the firelight, staring at me over their shoulders, with an intent expression on their ancient faces. Good night, I said, setting the door open. It's your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm. I left the door wide open until the candle was well alight, and then I shut them in, and walked down the chilly, echoing passage. I must confess that the oddness of these three old pensioners in whose charge her ladyship had left the castle and the deep-toned, old-fashioned furniture of the housekeeper's room in which they foregathered had affected me curiously in spite of my effort to keep myself at a matter-of-fact phase. They seemed to belong to another age, an older age, 
an age when things spiritual were indeed to be feared, when common sense was uncommon, an age when omens and witches were credible, and ghosts beyond denying. Their very existence, thought I, is spectral. The cut of their clothing, fashions born in dead brains, the ornaments and conveniences in the room about them even are ghostly. The thoughts of vanished men which still haunt rather than participate in the world of today. And the passage I was in, long and shadowy, with a film of moisture glistening on the walls, was as gaunt and cold as a thing that is dead and rigid. But with an effort, I sent such thoughts to the right about. The long, draughty, subterranean passage was chilly and dusty, and my candle flared and made the shadows cower and quiver. The echoes rang up and down the spiral staircase, and a shadow came sweeping up after me, and another fled before me into the darkness overhead. I came to the wide landing and stopped there for a moment, listening to a rustling that I fancied I heard creeping behind me, and then, satisfied of the absolute silence, pushed open the unwilling baize-covered door and stood in the silent corridor. The effect was scarcely what I expected, for the moonlight coming in by the great window on the grand staircase picked out everything in vivid black shadow or reticulated silvery illumination. Everything seemed in its proper position. The house might have been deserted on the yesterday instead of twelve months ago. There were candles in the sockets of the sconces, and whatever dust had gathered on the carpets or upon the polished floor was distributed so evenly as to be invisible in my candlelight. A waiting stillness was over everything. I was about to advance, and stopped abruptly. A bronze group stood upon the landing hidden from me by a corner of the wall, but its shadow fell with marvellous distinctness upon the white panelling and gave me the impression of someone crouching to waylay me. The thing jumped upon my attention suddenly. I stood rigid for half a moment, perhaps. Then, with my hand in the pocket that held the revolver, I advanced. Only to discover a Ganymede and Eagle glistening in the moonlight. That incident for a time restored my nerve, and a dim porcelain Chinaman on a boule table whose head rocked as I passed scarcely startled me. The door of the red room and the steps up to it were in a shadowy corner. I moved my candle from side to side in order to see clearly the nature of the recess in which I stood before opening the door. Here it was, thought I, that my predecessor was found and the memory of that story gave me a sudden twinge of apprehension. I glanced over my shoulder at the black Ganymede in the moonlight, and opened the door of the red room rather hastily, with my face half turned to the pallid silence of the corridor. I entered, closed the door behind me at once, turned the key I found in the lock within, and stood with the candle held aloft, surveying the scene of my vigil, the great red room of Lorraine Castle, in which the young duke had died, or rather in which he had begun his dying, for he had opened the door and fallen headlong down the steps I had just ascended. That had been the end of his vigil, of his gallant attempt to conquer the ghostly tradition of the place, and never, I thought, had apoplexy better served the ends of superstition. There were other and older stories that clung to the room, back to the half-incredible beginning of it all, the tale of a timid wife and the tragic end that came to her husband's jest of frightening her. And looking round that huge shadowy room with its black window bays, its recesses and alcoves, its dusty brown-red hangings and dark gigantic furniture, one could well understand the legends that had sprouted in its black corners, its germinating darknesses. My candle was a little tongue of light in the vastness of the chamber. Its rays failed to pierce the opposite end of the room and left an ocean of dull red mystery and suggestion, sentinel shadows and watching darknesses beyond its island of light. 
and the stillness of desolation brooded over it all. I must confess some impalpable quality of that ancient room disturbed me. I tried to fight the feeling down. I resolved to make a systematic examination of the place, and so, by leaving nothing to the imagination, dispel the fanciful suggestions of the obscurity before they obtained a hold upon me. After satisfying myself of the fastening of the door, I began to walk around the room, peering around each article of furniture, tucking up the valances of the bed and opening its curtains wide. In one place, there was a distinct echo to my footsteps. The noises I made seemed so little that they enhanced rather than broke the silence of the place. I pulled up the blinds and examined the fastenings of the several windows. Attracted by the fall of a particle of dust, I leaned forward and looked up the blackness of the wide chimney. Then trying to preserve my scientific attitude of mind, I walked round and began tapping the oak panelling for any secret opening. But I desisted before reaching the alcove. I saw my face in a mirror. White. There were two big mirrors in the room, each with a pair of sconces bearing candles, and on the mantel shelf too were candles in china candlesticks. All these I lit one after the other. The fire was laid, an unexpected consideration from the old housekeeper, and I lit it to keep down any disposition to shiver. And when it was burning well, I stood around with my back to it and regarded the room again. I had pulled up a chintz-covered armchair and a table to form a kind of barricade before me. On this lay my revolver, ready to hand. My precise examination had done me a little good, but I still found the remoter darkness of the place and its perfect stillness too stimulating for the imagination. The echoing of the stir and crackling of the fire was no sort of comfort to me. The shadow in the alcove at the end of the room began to display that undefinable quality of a presence. That odd suggestion of a lurking living thing that comes so easily in silence and solitude. And to reassure myself, I walked with a candle into it and satisfied myself that there was nothing tangible there. I stood that candle upon the floor of the alcove and left it in that position. By this time I was in a state of considerable nervous tension, although to my reason there was no adequate cause for my condition. My mind, however, was perfectly clear. I postulated, quite unreservedly, that nothing supernatural could happen, and to pass the time I began stringing some rhymes together, in Goldsby fashion, concerning the original legend of the place. A few I spoke aloud, but the echoes were not pleasant. For the same reason, I also abandoned, after a time, a conversation with myself upon the impossibility of ghosts and haunting. My mind reverted to the three old and distorted people downstairs, and I tried to keep it upon that topic. The sombre reds and greys of the room troubled me. Even with its seven candles, the place was merely dim. The light in the alcove flaring in a draught, and the fire flickering kept the shadows and penumbra perpetually shifting and stirring in a noiseless, flighty dance. Casting about for a remedy, I recalled the wax candles I had seen in the corridor, and with a slight effort, carrying a candle and leaving the door open, I walked out into the moonlight, and presently returned with as many as ten. These I put in various knick-knacks of china, with which the room was sparsely adorned, and lit and placed them where the shadows had lain deepest, some on the floor, some in the window recesses, arranging and rearranging them until at last my seventeen candles were so placed that not an inch of the room but had the direct light of at least one of them. It occurred to me that when the ghost came, I could warn him not to trip over them. The room was now quite brightly illuminated. There was something very cheering and reassuring in these little silent, streaming flames and to notice their steady diminution of length offered me an occupation and gave me a reassuring sense of the passage of time. Even with that, however, the brooding expectation of the vigil weighed heavily enough upon me. 
I stood watching the minute hand of my watch creep towards midnight. Then something happened in the alcove. I did not see the candle go out. I simply turned and saw that the darkness was there, as one might start and see the unexpected presence of a stranger. The black shadow had sprung back to its place. By Jove, said I aloud, recovering from my surprise. That draft's a strong one. And taking the matchbox from the table, I walked across the room in a leisurely manner to relight the corner again. My first match would not strike. And as I succeeded with the second, something seemed to blink on the wall before me. I turned my head involuntarily and saw that the two candles on the little table by the fireplace were extinguished. I rose at once to my feet. Odd, I said. Did I do that myself in a flash of absent-mindedness? I walked back, relit one, and as I did so I saw the candle in the right sconce of one of the mirrors wink and go right out, and almost immediately its companion followed it. The flames vanished as if the wick had been suddenly nipped between a finger and a thumb, leaving the wick neither glowing nor smoking but black. While I stood gaping, the candle at the foot of the bed went out, and the shadows seemed to take another step towards me. This won't do, said I, and first one and then another candle on the mantel shelf followed. What is happening? I cried, with a queer high note getting into my voice somehow and that the candle on the corner of the wardrobe went out, and the one I'd relit in the alcove followed. Steady on, I said, those candles are wanted. Speaking with a half-hysterical facetiousness, and scratching away at a match the while. For, for the mantle candlesticks. My hands trembled so much that twice I missed the rough paper of the matchbox. As the mantle emerged from the darkness again, two candles in the remoter end of the room were eclipsed. But with the same match I also relit the larger mirror candles and those on the floor near the doorway, so that for the moment I seemed to gain on the extinctions. But then, in a noiseless volley, there vanished four lights at once in different corners of the room and I struck another match in quivering haste and stood hesitating whither to take it. As I stood undecided an invisible hand seemed to sweep out the two candles on the table. With a cry of terror, I dashed at the alcove and into the corner and then into the window, relighting three as two more vanished by the fireplace and then, perceiving a better way, I dropped matches on the iron-bound deed box in the corner and caught up the bedroom candlestick. With this I avoided the delay of striking matches. But for all that the steady process of extinction went on and the shadows I feared and fought against returned and crept in upon me. First a step gained on this side of me and then on the other side. I was now almost frantic with the horror of the coming darkness and my self-possession deserted me. I leaped, panting from candle to candle in a vain struggle against the remorseless advanced. I bruised myself in the thigh against the table. I sent a chair headlong. I stumbled and fell and whisked the cloth from the table in my fall. My candle rolled away from me and I snatched another as I rose. Abruptly this was blown out as I swung it off the table by the wind of my sudden movement. And immediately the two remaining candles followed. But there was still light in the room. A red light that streamed across the ceiling and staved off the shadows from me. The fire! Of course, I could still thrust my candle between the bars and relight it. I turned to where the flames were still dancing between the glowing coals and splashing red reflections upon the furniture, made two steps toward the grate, and incontinently the flames dwindled and vanished. The glow vanished. The reflections rushed together and disappeared, and as I thrust my candle between the bars, darkness closed upon me like the shutting of an eye, wrapped about me in a stifling embrace, sealed my vision, and crushed the last vestiges of self-possession from my brain. 
and it was not only palpable darkness, but intolerable terror. The candle fell from my hands. I flung out my arms in a vain effort to thrust that ponderous blackness away from me and lifting up my voice, screamed with all my might, once, twice, thrice. Then I think I must have staggered to my feet. I know I thought suddenly of the moonlit corridor and with my head bowed and my arms over my face made a stumbling run for the door. But I had forgotten the exact position of the door and I struck myself heavily against the corner of the bed and staggered back, turned, and was either struck or struck myself against some other bulky furnishing. I have a vague memory of battering myself thus to and fro in the darkness, of a heavy blow at last upon my forehead, of a horrible sensation of falling that lasted an age, of my last frantic effort to keep my footing, and then I remember no more. I opened my eyes in daylight. My head was roughly bandaged and the man with the withered hand was watching my face. I looked about me trying to remember what had happened and for a space I could not recollect. I rolled my eyes into the corner and saw the old woman no longer abstracted, no longer terrible, pouring out some drops of medicine from a little blue phial into a glass. Where am I? I said. I seem to remember you and yet I cannot remember who you are. They told me then and I heard of the haunted red room as one who hears a tale. We found you at dawn, said he, and there was blood on your forehead and lips. I wondered that I had ever disliked them. The three of them in daylight seemed commonplace old folk enough. The man with the green shade had his head bent as one who sleeps. It was very slowly I recovered the memory of my experience. You believe now, said the old man with the withered hand, that the room is haunted. He spoke no longer as one who greets an intruder, but as one who condoles with a friend. Yes, said I, the room is haunted. And you have seen it, and we who have been here all of our lives have never set eyes upon it, because we have never dared. Tell us, is it truly the old Earl who no? I said, no, it is not. I told you so, said the old lady with her glass in her hand. It is his poor young countess who was frightened. It is not, I said. There is neither ghost of Earl nor ghost of Countess in that room. There is no ghost there at all, but worse. Far worse, something impalpable. Well, they said. The worst of all things that haunt poor mortal men, said I. And that is, in all its nakedness, fear. Fear that will not have light nor sound, that will not bear with reason that deafens and darkens and overwhelms. It followed me through the corridor. It fought against me in the room. I stopped abruptly. There was an interval of silence. My hand went up to my bandages. The candles went out, one after another, and I fled. Then the man with the shade lifted his face sideways to see me and spoke. That is it, said he. I knew that was it. A power of darkness. To put such a curse upon a home, it lurks there always. You can feel it even in the daytime, even of a bright summer's day, in the hangings, in the curtains, keeping behind you however you face about it. In the dusk, it creeps in the corridor and follows you, so that you dare not turn. It is even as you say. Fear itself is in that room. Black fear. And there it will be, so long as this house of sin endures. <laughs>